This is a reading from Atlas Shrugged, the Taggart train tunnel disaster from the chapter The Moratorium on Brains, one of my favorite passages from the book. This passage really hits. She wrote this perfectly. Uh, Just as a bit of a backstory, the looters and the moochers are in charge of Washington, D.C. in the United States, kind of like they are today, and as a result, everything is going to hell in a handbasket. The trains are not working because nobody's there to fix them and build new ones uh, because incompetence is rewarded. So the train system keeps breaking down. This corrupt politician named Kip Chalmers or Mr. Chalmers demands that they send him to San Francisco where he's stuck in Colorado overnight and he threatens them if they do not, it's going to be big trouble. So they order his train to be carried by a coal-burning, black smoke coal-burning locomotive through a 20-mile tunnel. And, uh, yeah, this is the result. The conductor stood by the rear end of the comet. He looked at the lights of the tunnel, then at the long chain of the comet's windows. A few windows were lighted, but most of them showed only the feeble blue glow of night lamps edging the lowered blinds. He thought that he should rouse the passengers and warn them. There had been a time when he had placed the safety of the passengers above his own, not by reason of love for his fellow men, but because that responsibility was part of his job, which he accepted and felt pride in fulfilling. Now he felt a contemptuous indifference and no desire to save them. They had asked for and accepted Directive 10289, he thought. They went on living and daily turning away in evasion from the kind of verdicts that the Unification Board was passing on defenseless victims. Why shouldn't he now turn away from them? If he saved their lives, not one of them would come forward to defend him when the Unification Board would convict him for disobeying orders, for creating a panic, for delaying Mr. Chalmers. He had no desire to be a martyr for the sake of allowing people safely to indulge in their own irresponsible evil. When the moment came, he raised his lantern and signaled the engineer to start. See? said Kip Chalmers triumphantly to Lester Tuck, as the wheels under their feet shuddered forward. Fear is the only practical means to deal with people. The conductor stepped onto the vestibule of the last car. No one saw him as he went down the steps of the other side, slipped off the train, and vanished into the darkness of the mountains. A switchman stood ready to throw the switch that would send the comet from the siding onto the main track. He looked at the comet as it came slowly toward him. It was only a blazing white globe with a beam stretching high above his head and a jerky thunder trembling through the rail under his feet. He knew that the switch should not be thrown. He thought of the night ten years ago when he had risked his life in a flood to save a train from a washout. But he knew that times had changed. In the moment when he threw the switch and saw the headlight jerk sidewise, he knew that he would now hate his job for the rest of his life. The comet uncoiled from the siding into a thin, straight line and went on into the mountains with the beam of the headlight like an extended arm pointing the way and the lighted glass curve of the observation lounge edging it, ending it off. Some of the passengers aboard the comet were awake. As the train started its coiling ascent, they saw the small cluster of Winston's lights, Winston, Colorado, at the bottom of the darkness beyond their windows. Then the same darkness, but with red and green lights by the hole of a tunnel on the upper edge of the window panes. The lights of Winston kept growing smaller each time they appeared. The black hole of the tunnel kept growing larger. A black veil went streaking past the windows at times, dimming the lights. It was the heavy smoke from the coal-burning engine. As the tunnel came closer, they saw, on the edge of the sky far to the south, in a void of space and rock, a spot of living fire twisting in the wind. They did not know what it was and did not care to learn. It is said that catastrophes are a matter of pure chance, and and there were those who would have said that the passengers of the comet were not guilty or responsible for the thing that happened to them. The man in bedroom A, car number one, was a professor of sociology who taught that individual ability is of no consequence, that individual effort is futile, that an individual conscience is a useless luxury, that there is no individual mind or character or achievement, that everything is achieved collectively, and that it's masses that count, not men. 
The man in room at seven, car number two, was a journalist who wrote that it is proper and moral to use compulsion for a good cause, who believed that he had the right to unleash physical force upon others, to wreck lives, throttle ambitions, strangle desires, violate convictions, to imprison, to despoil, to murder, for the sake of whatever he chose to consider as his own idea of a good cause, which did not even have to be an idea, since he had never defined what he regarded as the good, but had merely stated that he went by a feeling, a feeling unrestrained by any knowledge, since he considered emotion superior to knowledge and relied solely on his own good intentions and on the power of a gun. The woman in room at 10, car number three, was an elderly school teacher who had spent her life turning class after class of helpless children into miserable cowards by teaching them that the will of the majority is the only standard of good and evil, that a majority may do anything it pleases, that they must not assert their own personalities but must do as others were doing. The man in drawing room B, car number four, was a newspaper publisher who believed that men are evil by nature and unfit for freedom, that their basic instincts, if left unchecked, are to lie, to rob, and to murder one another, and therefore men must be ruled by means of lies, mob robbery, and murder, which must be made the exclusive privilege of the rulers for the purpose of forcing men to work, teaching them to be moral, and keeping them within the bounds of order and justice. The man in bedroom H, car number five, was a businessman who had acquired his business, an ore mine, with the help of a government loan under the Equalization of Opportunity Bill. The man in drawing room A, car number six, was a financier who had made a fortune by buying frozen railroad bonds and getting his friends in Washington to defreeze them. The man in seat five, car number seven, was a worker who believed that he had a right to a job, whether his employer wanted him or not. The woman in room at six, car number eight, was a lecturer who believed that, as a consumer, she had a right to transportation, whether the railroad people wished to provide it or not. The man in room at two, car number nine, was a professor of economics who advocated the abolition of private property, explaining that intelligence plays no part in industrial production, that man's mind is conditioned by material tools, that anybody can run a factory or a railroad, and it's only a matter of seizing the machinery. The woman in bedroom D, car number 10, was a mother who had put her two children to sleep in the berth above her, carefully tucking them in, protecting them from drafts and jolts, a mother whose husband held a government job enforcing directives, which she defended by saying, I don't care, it's only the rich that they hurt. After all, I must think of my children. The man in room at three, car number 11, was a sniveling little neurotic who wrote cheap little plays into which, as a social message, he inserted cowardly little obscenities to the effect that all businessmen were scoundrels. The woman in room at nine, car number 12, was a housewife who believed that she had the right to elect politicians, of whom she knew nothing, to control giant industries of which she had no knowledge. The man in bedroom F, car number 13, was a lawyer who had said, Me? I'll find a way to get along under any political system. The man in bedroom A, car number 14, was a professor of philosophy who taught that there is no mind. How do you know that the tunnel is dangerous? No reality. How can you prove that the tunnel exists? No logic. Why do you claim that trains cannot move without motive power? No principles. Why should you be bound by the law of cause and effect? No rights. Why shouldn't you attach men to their jobs by force? No morality. What's moral about running a railroad? No absolutes. What difference does it make to you whether you live or die anyway? He taught that we know nothing. Why oppose the orders of your superiors? That we can never be certain of anything. How do you know you're right? that we must act on the expediency of the moment. You don't want to risk your job, do you? The man in drawing room B, car number 15, was an heir who had inherited his fortune and who had kept repeating, why should Reardon be the only one permitted to manufacture Reardon metal? The man in bedroom A, car number 16, was a humanitarian who had said, the men of ability... I do not care what or if they are made to suffer. They must be penalized in order to support the incompetent. Frankly, I do not care whether this is just or not. 
I take pride in not caring to grant any justice to the able where mercy to the needy is concerned. These passengers were awake. There was not a man aboard the train who did not share one or more of their ideas. As the train went into the tunnel, the flame of Wyatt's torch was the last thing they saw on earth. Kaboom!